All right, so we had gotten to the stage of uh, taking out the pre-cooked um, um, synthetic and looking at the first thing I like to look at. Well, first we had looked at the, uh, the progress of the uh, calculation, uh, bringing over um, some of the snap files that were coming out. And um, you know we were able to see um, uh, if we had waited uh, you know another ten minutes we would have be, been able to see the waves start to propagate and know that that things were not totally wrong. Um, we looked at some of the later um, time the later time snaps in the uh, um, in the uh, um, In the pre-cooked version, and that um, you know showed also what we expected. It also showed, suggested that uh, we would not see too much in the way of grid dispersion because we weren't seeing those sort of square waveforms at the sur surface. So, um, are you at the stage yet where you have extracted your um, uh, your dot capital V file, um, and can you get it into yeah, so that's the PGV output. Well, what's the? Uh, so you started your 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 calculation running, right? Yeah, it should be done. Oh yeah, it absolutely should. Yeah, even though it was going slow. Site folder, Slash. Okay, so let's. Slash Louis. Yeah, it, it's on Cogs. It's uh, slash space slash Louis slash MA, and then. Whatever folder you made inside that as guest, um, and oh yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Transmit, uh, not that one. Yeah, I've got all the snap files. Right. So the the most recent file should be. Um, v holding house max. Yep, yep, I've got it here um, from from my from my pre cooked calculation that includes the uh, Abbott and Louis local Reno basin model from uh, local Reno gravity, and yours should just have the uh, background regional Saltus and Jockins 1995 uh, basin map, which still has some basins in the in right in Reno, just not as much detail. Um, so let's get you to the stage. Can you run me through how to open that? Yeah. So let's just go through it through that. Um, so you want to open binary file. You want to locate your dot v file dot capital v, and um, you bring it in as a thirty two bit Intel float. You skip eight bytes. And um, and then uh, from the um, let's see um, from the uh, the dot in file you get the um, the elements per vector is is n on the grid line of the dot in file and the vectors per plane is l. On the uh, on the grid line, um, okay. So three eighty seven n is three eighty seven in our in our model here, and vectors per plane is two ninety four. That's L. M uh, on the grid line is the number of depth elements. Um, so you read binary file, and uh, you see that it's flipped north to south because of. Because the screen here uses ViewMat uses a right-handed coordinate system, and the um, um, and E3D uses a left-handed coordinate system. So um, we go to on each vector, and we um, uh, and we mirror it, and we mirror the whole range. <clears throat> okay. And then what you want to do is um, uh, yeah, 
here we go. You want to correct the title, make it a little simpler. You want to check positive amplitudes only. Um, you want to clip the amplitude. Uh, I say uh, try 30. Uh, that'll be 30 centimeters per second. And um, <clears throat> and the uh, um, the amplitude factor is 100 because it, the uh, the seismic shaking files, whether they're a snapshot or uh, whether they're a uh, uh, PGV file, the .dot .v file, uh, they come out in units of meters per second. You know, ground velocity, particle velocity, and so this is uh, PGV peak ground velocity, which is horizontal. That's that's what E3D assumes in centimeters per second. Centimeters per second. We're using the blue, red, orange, yellow. Um, the elements is the easting direction, so that was what 0.15, and uh, distance east, and then uh, yeah, the north side, the top of it is uh, is 58. I don't know what it was, 0.1 kilometers maybe. Oh, 44. Uh, yeah, I think it's 44.1 we had to use. And then that delta is minus 0 0.15 kilometers per uh, sample, 150 meter sample interval. So that's going to be distance north in kilometers. Apply the changes. And so now in solid yellow is everything over 30 centimeters per second, which on the, um, the uh, Shake map MMI scale, which I'll show you in just a second, is um, is called severe shaking. Um, let's see. There we go. Um, so let's. Um, Enlarge this so you can hopefully see it in the video. Um, this comes out with every shake map. Uh, you can go to the uh, UNR Seismolab. You can go to um, the uh, uh, Northern California, Southern California Earthquake Center, uh, Caltech, um, Pacific Northwest, um, Central um, Central U.S. Uh, they all produce shake maps for every earthquake in some scenarios, and um, so the uh, uh, perceived shaking when it's above um, when the peak velocity is above thirty is is above thirty uh, centimeters per second here, um, thirty to sixty uh, centimeters per second of uh, peak velocity. Um, it's called severe. You know, just under 30 centimeters per second, it's called uh, uh, it's called very strong. That's the perceived shaking. The potential damage to uh, buildings and infrastructure would be moderate to moderate and heavy. So, you know, this would be an economically uh, 30 centimeters per second would be an economically troublesome troublesome um, amount of shaking. Um, but of course, that's not the color scale that we have here. So. You know, now that I have this, I'm going to go ahead and uh, let's see. Let me just look at it uh, carefully. Yeah, uh, it's what I what I want. Um, so I'm going to save the JRG pack, so I don't have to relabel my axes every single time. Um, and of course, I've already saved it. I'll just replace it. So I've got that saved. But now, what I want to do is um, I want to um, I want to put this on the uh, my PGV map. I want to put it on the as, as close something as close to the shake map MMI color scale that I can. And I think if you examine the scale, you'll see that the thing to do is to take the log of the um, of the ground motion of the PGV. Um, so, but. Uh, you know, it's all under one, so I don't want it to go. I don't want the log to be negative. So I'm going to, on whole data set, uh, molt C, I'm going to multiply every value by 100 so that it will 
you know, not just in terms of the color bar, but it's going to show me it's going to have values in it that are in centimeters per second instead of meters per second. <clears throat> okay, and um, so uh, you know, I can go back into my uh, into my plot parameters, and uh, I can correct that. Uh, oh, that is centimeters. Okay, and um, yeah, I still want to clip it at thirty. So if I reapply that, that works. Um, looks the same, color bar is the same, um, but now the values are are natively in centimeters per second. So now I can take a um, uh, I can take a a uh, a log. So that's on a whole data set. And the log to base ten is just the uh, log function, okay. And um, and you can barely see anything on there anymore. Of course, the log you know squashes down all the all the high values. Um, and uh, if by setting things up right in the uh, um, in the plot parameters, I can roughly approximate the shake map. Um, uh, MMI um, Mercalli uh, 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 modified Mercalli intensity scale. So the amplitude clip is going to be two point one two. Um, I've just you know figured this out, um, and uh, uh, the scale is still log ten of PGV, um, and. Uh, Nothing else changed. The, the only other thing I need to change is the color scale, and uh, I think the topographic one is the one I wanted. Yeah. Okay. So this is um, uh, not exact, but kind of kind of close to the uh, shake map um, color scale. So. Uh, <coughs> Where you have, um, you know, one it's it's light blue. Where you have about one um, um, centimeter per second of uh, of PGV peak velocity, um, and that's uh, that's what we have here. Um, and uh, let's see, the um, you know the yellow and dark and and redder. Uh, yellow and orange colors indicate where we're getting the uh, uh, the strong shaking, the very strong to the severe, etc. Okay, above uh, eight, uh, about eight uh, centimeters per second. So this is not bad. As you can see, even lower values um, fade to uh, you know purple black, whereas on the shake map scale they fade to white. So I should fix that up and and uh, <clears throat> um, make the colors correspond. But uh, at least at the high values, then the, the colors are more familiar to uh, to some to some people uh, people who are used to looking at shake maps. Okay, so I'm going to save this as well. Uh, let's see. I think everything is labeled the way I want. I want to take out the pics I've made. Um, <clears throat> so uh, you know we can see here that there's some some bands of uh, of um, you know very strong shaking with moderate damage, but mo most of it throughout the according to this prediction, you know, with this crazy boundary between the two different basin models, um, you know, most of the uh, uh, most of the basins, the urban basins, Reno, South Reno, Sparks, they're predicted to have strong shaking and, and light damage. How many emails do you find? Ah, okay. Um, right. Um, yeah, so let me just. Um, uh, a couple more operations with this. Um, we're going to uh, save it as a JRG pack, and 
I just call it the same thing except instead of molt C log, I'm just going to call it, uh, after mirror I'll put MMI, uh, just to indicate uh, that's what it is. <clears throat> and I'll also save a PNG image. So under save images I'll write a PNG file. And thinking about how I might use that image, maybe I'll cut it back to um, I'll cut the view back to 100%, so the text won't be ridiculously small. You know, so when I show that PNG image in a slide, uh, the text won't be un totally unreadable. And I've got to put MMI on that too. Okay, so let's bring those up. <clears throat> um, so Okay, looking at looking at this image, it doesn't get to yellow anywhere in the Reno Basin. Um, that's the Steamboat Hills, I think. And yeah, there's the there's the representation of the Reno Basin, but it's so smooth, right? You see this band along uh, East Sparks and the east side of South Reno, right? But that looks like it's not. It's not. Uh, it's not getting anywhere near. Um, yeah. So. Uh, uh, where, is, where is downtown in your model? Okay. So so, it's right in the middle. Right there. Yeah. It's like right right here. You know, we're at the the top of the. The north end of the ridge that runs between the Sparks Basin and deeper uh, West Reno Basin. Um, so it's somewhere in here, and this is the same color scale. It's maxing out at thirty centimeters per second. So um, what we're what okay? So so your model has enabled the. Um, the Rayleigh waves to propagate smoothly, and we'll see this in the in the animations. Your model has enabled the Rayleigh waves to propagate smoothly along the surface from the, you know, above the fault, you know, into the basins, and you can see they're they're converting gently in this area, uh, and producing uh, increased motions within the basin. Um, gosh, I wonder. Uh, yeah. D d uh, does your um, does your geotechnical map look the same as mine? The uh, the VS thirty velocity map. I'm not sure. Okay, that's that's the first thing to check out with 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 yours. We we checked it, you know, uh, two weeks ago. On that was the last thing we did on Friday. Was look at the velocity map. Um, I thought that was the same, yeah, the Abbott Louie VS30. It's in my in file input. Yeah, yeah. It should be in there. Yeah. Right, right, but you want to see that you, you know, you always want to double check the result. You know, what was the VS30 really applied to your model? You know, yeah. and, and the other thing to check is, is in the, in the log file that, um, nohup.out, Okay, so here's the no hub dot out right, and if I, you know, in in FileZilla or um, or uh, um, or in um, Transmit like I have, we can um, we can check it out with uh, text edit, and at the top of it, you know, what is the minimum Velocity in the grid, you know, which will be not as low as the minimum velocity in the uh, 
in the velocity file, but um, yes. yeah. So for you, okay. And let's see what I had. Uh, I just have to be able to alphabetize here. Okay. Oh, I have to reconnect. That 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 makes sense uh, because the um, you know the velocities applied are are different. My min so you, are just a little bit lower. Yeah. Velocity. So your min vs is actually lower. So there are places in your model where you're getting down to, you know, surface velocities as low as what what I've got. Okay. But it's the smoothness of the basins that you know these basins are very shallow walled. I was just thinking we're looking at PGV, so if you have those scatters like that giant interface, you might get positive interference in some places and kind of spike up the PGV, whereas mine, the wave front's just going to kind of smoothly. Right. Now, now where that in the, 2D, in the plane map view as well. Now looking at looking at my at my map, um, you can see that that there's higher. Uh, uh, PGVs sort of spread along the uh, along the boundary on the on the low velocity side. I think that's where the interf that interference is happening. Mm. Okay. okay. Um, and beyond the boundary, it's actually you know you have a little bit more motion, like right there. It's a little bit redder than mine. Um, let's see. What's strange is mine is different up top, where there should be no change. Ah, but that's um, that that always happens. That cone is narrower too. Mine is right, right. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and and this is again. You know, this is a this is full wave propagation. You know, with the uh, we're not just taking the first two terms of the Born approximation. We're taking all the Born terms out to at least as many as you can get fit into um, into uh, uh, sixty seconds of wave propagation in this area. So there are there are you know easily fifty times multiple reflections in here, horizontally and vertically. Um, so, so you know, this is this is where Feynman's, uh, you know, the Feynman's idea that we're using in imaging, you know, we can see in the wave propagation here, you know, every every part of the model is affecting every other part of the model. You can't really isolate them. So the complexity of the basin model is is affecting the uh, the results uh, everywhere else. You know, I don't see a lot of difference up here in the northwest corner of the model. That looks fairly similar. Yeah, I was thinking like the north and the top, but I guess it could be refracting around that. Yeah, yeah, that's got to have an effect. You know, so now what's happening in in with the Abbott model is that um, uh, while we're reflecting the Rayleigh waves off the off at the surface, off the boundary between the two basin models, we're um, they're still getting uh, a lot of motion from underneath because the fault is fairly deep, and it's not very far. You know, the southwest end of the fault is not very far from the um, from the boundary of the model, and so the um, the uh, um, um, there are still, you know, there are body waves that are coming in, and they're hitting the edges, these sharp edges in the Abbott in the Abbott model, 
and they're of the basin of the Reno and South Reno basins. They're hitting the sharp edges and they're converting to surface waves. Um, there's also, I think, a lensing effect. Uh, you can see these sort of streaks. That looks to me like a geometric, very simple geometric focusing effect. And uh, for more on that, I would suggest you take a look at uh, the the paper by um, uh, Shahar Kadmiel, um, uh, who's a PhD student at uh, um, uh, Ben Gurion University in Beersheba, and he's uh, he wrote a paper with me um, about um, these uh, geometric uh, lensing effects. So we're seeing a uh, you know kind of focal. Um, you know, focal points for the bending of the, and the basins are lens shaped, so that kind of makes sense. You know, they're low velocity, so they concentrate energy. So that, uh, you know, that local model is basically hypothesizing here that I, I say, I think it's about doubling the amount of expected energy in, um, you know, if we compare. If we compare the uh, regional model, re regional basins only, to the local basin model, uh, I think in the urban area we're about doubling the uh, the amount of energy, or the uh, the not the amount of energy, we're about doubling the ground shaking. Um, so uh, now you know how much impact that has on the. Uh, um, on the uh, casualties and 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 the prediction of the damage, you know that's something that we could get by running these results, these PGV maps through a uh, FEMA program called HAZUS, has US, and that'll actually make an estimate of the uh, economic and uh, uh, economic damage and the casualties. Um, all right, now we'll learn more by examining the wave propagation. Okay, and that's where we'll get a final ruling on on you know are we seeing any obvious uh, grid dispersion? You know, have we really pushed the frequency too high? Um, so, for instance, there would be if we had calculated this at uh, 0.1 hertz instead of uh, instead of 0.5 hertz, I would say there'd be no difference between between our results. You know, there's no substantial difference. If we had used very low frequencies, but we went up to pretty high frequencies, so that's where that's where the additional detail of the of the of the Abbott Basin was activated. So this is a, uh, what this is turning out to be, Kyle, is a really important sensitivity study for these high for these high frequency uh, models. It looks um, like the low frequency doesn't show that boundary between those two different models at all. I think I think you're right. Yes, yes. The low frequency. I, I think you'll you'll if we rerun this calculation at at point one hertz, which we could easily do. Uh, we don't have to. We don't have to. You know, subsample the model or anything. We just put in a lower frequency source. I, I think we'll find that that uh, there's hardly any difference between these two. So that would be a good sensitivity study to run. I mean. All the time, these maps raise all these interesting questions. Okay, so let's let's assemble the um, let's assemble the uh, the wave propagation and um, uh, get a uh, get a view of of all this. <clears throat> um, let's see. No. Okay. <clears throat> um, so uh, um, you want to log into uh, Cogs, right? I'm downloading them. Is that what you wanted me to do? Downloading? Not, not quite yet. Uh, I mean, you you will want to anyway. I've got them now. Oh, we're gonna compile it there, I guess. E yeah, yeah. So, so there's uh, many gigabytes of um, of these snapshots, right? Okay. Yeah, mine is 700 megabytes. Okay, not not I too bad. I had a much lower sampling rate than you did on the movies. I don't know why. Oh, okay. Maybe we didn't change that in the right place. I must have not got it right. 
Yeah. So what's what's the interval between yours? Uh, it's about one every nine. Okay. So I'll have, I mean, I'll have two hundred. Is that how we did it? And you'll have maybe sixty. That's still enough for an okay movie. Um, no, because I, I mean, I have like six hundred and something. Six hundred or so. Oh. Really? A snap files? Okay. Well, we'll we'll we'll, we'll figure this out. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so uh, um, space M A, um, no, space Louis M A. And um, okay, so um, actually, first I want to go up to a uh, well, actually, before I do that, I'm going to make a couple folders. Um, I'm going to make one called Snaps, and I'm going to make one called Sack. And so I'm going to list everything with uh, Snap. Um, <clears throat> And uh, oh, okay. There's uh, there's snaps there. Let's see. Um, and you see, at every time step, there's three files. Uh, so I want to ls uh, star dash snap dot star. Okay. Now, I, of course, I can't see all those. And how many? You know, one question is, how many do I have? So um, I'll uh, do the same command. And actually, let me increase the size here. OK. ls uh, star dash snap dot star. Um, and then I'm going to pipe the output of that list command into word count. So it tells me there are uh, 6,000 names. Good grief! No, I'm the one who set who said it wrong. I've got way too many snapshots. Six hundred and eighteen. Yeah. So you have there. There are two hundred, um, two hundred and two, um, you know, snapshots, time snaps, and that's how many we wanted. And I have I'm, I have two thousand. I have a snapshot every. Okay. Um, so uh, okay, we'll have to deal with that somehow. Um, all right. So I'm going to go into your um, folder because your folder is right there somewhere, right? So we'll recover your yours first. That'll take a lot less time. Um. um Oh, actually, no. No. And uh, where am I? OK. So uh, I, I need to get all these snap files out of the way, first thing. So uh, and I made my folder called snaps, and so I'm going to say mv um, uh, star dash snap dot star um, to snaps, um, and if I just said star snap star, then it would try to put snaps the folder snaps into the folder snaps, and then it would fail. So I have to do it. I have to be a little more literal here. Okay. Now let's let's see about the sack files. Let's see star sack star, and uh, so let's try um, ls. Um, uh, oh yeah, there's the time hist. Um, I don't want to move that necessarily. 
the rupture time history. So we'll have uh, star um, dot uh, sack. Yeah, and then, you know, uh, let's see, is that going to work? No. Yeah, you're right. Dot zero will, will be the way to do it. Yeah. Okay. And so now I'm just going to move those files into SAC. Okay. So now it's, uh, uh, you know, we've, we've cleaned that up. I still have the, the dot V capital, the dot capital V file in there. I still got the, in the, in the main folder, I still got the Olinghouse MA. All right. <clears throat> um, so the, the first thing I need to do is, um, is figure out uh, <clears throat> uh, where I have a certain script. So I'm going to um, look at um, this uh, enterprise uh, earthquake scenario that I that I just did. Is it okay to get rid of all the Java? Uh, no, um, I tend not to do that. Okay. First of all, they're small, and um, to, to have a full representation of what exactly the, was the model you ran, you need all of the you need all the data files, um, you know, like uh, the uh, the Reno Abbott Thick, the uh, the Remy VS30, the Jockins Basin Death. You need all those all those data files. You need all the code, right? Because a lot of the a lot of the characteristics of the run are set by the um, are set by the the rules.java, okay, um, and um, uh, and there are older versions. So when you you know if you came back in five years and tried to figure out exactly what it was that you that you had done, uh, you would really need all of this. And um, you know these days, uh, you know the amount of space occupied by the Java codes is microscopic compared to the amount of space occupied by the outputs. So I recommend every single scenario you do, you keep everything and you keep it all in that folder, and then you have a folder structure which represents, uh, you know, sort of your tree of different scenarios. Um, and and every scenario is completely self-contained. Which means you can also, you know, take all the code and run it on some other machine. You know, so you have everything. You know, these days with our disk capacity, we don't we don't need to worry about you know deleting files. So I agree, it's it's entirely a uh, a mess. You know, but at least if you if you don't delete any of those files, you've got everything is there, and it's not it's very poorly organized, but. Um, <clears throat> okay, now to 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 find the uh, the scripts, I'm going to do an ls, uh, and and I think the latest one I should have it in is this enterprise m3.6 folder, uh, where I have all the files for my enterprise run, and there's this down in there in its snaps folder. There's a um, um, there's this conf3c.sh, so. Uh, I'm going to copy um, uh, that com3c um, down into your folder, and and what's your folder's name? The reader with the capital R. Okay, and do you have a snaps folder? Yeah, it's just snaps all over the place. Okay, so that should work. Uh, and uh, can you run this command um, in your folder? Um, and this is safe here because you can't, you know, unless you have some login and password uh, to COGS, you can never get in here. So you might as well make everything writable by everybody. So uh, you want to um, you want to go to your um, 
you want to go to the uh, to this folder, space Louis M A, and um, and I'm going to do this with with my folder, and you can do the same thing with yours, uh, which is uh, ch mod um, all plus right. Oops, plus small a plus right. No, ch mod minus capital R, little a plus write permission. Um, and you would you would run you would run it on reader and I'm gonna run it on Olinghouse. Okay. So because um, <clears throat> I don't have you know permission Louis doesn't have permission to write over guests uh, files. And so then I'll try the uh, that again, and that ran. Okay. So um, uh, now we need we need another we need one more file though. Okay. Let's go down and look at that script. We'll cd into reader snaps, and um, uh, I'm going to come out to. Uh, um, to transmit, and we're going to take a look at. Uh, uh, and where is reader? There it is. Okay, and there's snaps. All right, and then I'm going to open com3c.sh with uh, text edit, so you can see it. Um, okay, so um, uh, this is going to list all of the snaps. And are yours called snap.intel or snap.ieee? Snap.intel. Okay, and then um, you know if if there were if there were more than um, if we had done more than ten thousand time steps, we'd have to add another question mark here, which is a wild card that requires something to be there. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, what usually happens is um, um, we have to do, you know, we have to state it slightly differently for numbers less than 100 and numbers less than 10. But um, it's going to run this three comp image, um, <clears throat> and it's uh, um, and that's going to combine the dot x, the dot y, and the dot z components into a color view of the wave propagation. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, but there's another file we need before that, and so I'm going to make a simpler. Uh, I'm going to make a simpler file first. Um, and so. Uh, um, I guess I need to uh, let's see. All right, that's text edit. Um, and we're going to do it on on yours because I produce I overproduced my uh, my snapshots by a big margin. Um, that is. Uh, let me just show you where that's controlled. Um, Yeah right. Uh, this uh, this thing can't even list it. Okay, um, what we need to find. Uh, let's look. Let's look at your. Uh, let's see. We'll come up out of snaps. Okay, we're in reader now, and we're going to look at. Uh, uh, actually, I should do this on here. No, I'll do it on here. Um, just know that when whenever I use VI in here, you can you can use uh, you know you can open your file through FileZilla with uh, text edit. Um, so I'm going to list uh, uh, star dot in, and there's only that one. So we're gonna we're gonna look at it, and I'm going to show you where what controls the. Uh, um, the uh, 
the writing of uh, of the snapshots. So here's the uh, the snapshot output, which is a E3D image output. Mode equals two is snapshots, and movie equals 29. That means every 29 time steps, it's going to put out a uh, a um, <clears throat> a movie frame, and um, and there are 6,001 time steps, so that means that we're going to get uh, about uh, about 200 different movie frames. You know, which would be 6,000 divided by 30. Um, and you don't get the first one. You you get the first frame you get is not zero, time step zero, but time step 29. <clears throat> so there's one little little sort of bug in there. <clears throat> so if you have a, uh, a movie frame number, so the movie frames are separated by 29 times 10 milliseconds, so they're separated by uh, 290 milliseconds. Okay, so um, if we take uh, 1 over 0 0.29, that means the, the f they, we have about, uh, we have 3.2 five frames per second, okay? Um, and yeah, but it, there's too much information, you know? And it'll take too long to do the conversion. Um, let's see. Um, so uh, um, that's 3.4 frames per second. And if we play it, if if we if we make a <coughs> a movie that's uh, twenty frames per per second, <clears throat> then uh, what's our time lapse speed up? Okay, so that's that would be twenty divided by this uh, this uh, three point um, <clears throat> yeah um, <clears throat> twenty divided by this quantity. So um, uh, so it's going to be uh, 20 times, uh, hard for me to do algebra in my head, the time lapse speed up will be not quite 6. Okay, That's an important thing to remember as you're presenting these animations. You know, how much faster are they going than the real, than the real velocity, than the real uh, propagation? OK, so. Um, uh, what we what we want to do here is um, uh, okay. Quit out of that. Go back to snaps, <coughs> where we have the uh, you know all those all those frames, and let's 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 uh, let's concatenate all the X frames. 